All righty, we'll go ahead and, and begin. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Um, inshallah, everyone's Ramadan is going well. We are now past the halfway point. So um, glad you guys are all here with us today. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time um, with, an, with any introductions or um, anything, but my name is Shadia Igram. I'm the executive director of Muslim Space. Uh, we're mainly based out of Austin, Texas. With us today is Dr. Celine Ibrahim, who will be presenting uh, her two two of the three part halakha series, women and gender in the Quran. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to to Dr. Ibrahim and let her take it away. Assalamualaikum warahmatullah. It's an honor to be with you all, and thank you again for uh, Muslim Space for sponsoring this lecture series. Let me get my screen shared here. So for this particular week, we're going to be focusing on the trajectory of women figures as compared to how the prophetic sira, uh, how the prophet's life, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is developing as the Qur'an is being revealed. And we're going to look at how the women figures who are mentioned in the Qur'an relate to events in the sira, inshallah. Before we get there, let's get the slideshow started. Uh, before we get there, inshallah, Ramadan Kareem to everyone, inshallah, we're, uh, as we're in the middle of the month, we're enjoying these days of forgiveness, inshallah, and getting ready to sink into the benefits of, of these last days. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ahli Sayyidina Muhammad, kima salaita ala Ibrahim wa ala ahli Ibrahim fil alameen, inna ka hamid al-majid. Again, the series, the purpose of the series is to think at both an intellectual level and a heart level about what the stories in the Quran, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala narrates specific stories that are in there, what are the lessons that we can take from them, both heart lessons and uh, intellectual lessons. So I invite you all, as I always do, to center yourself in your particular intentions. Uh, inshallah, many of us are um, at the, the Asr, around the Asr time, and uh, hopefully this lecture will help get us over the hump of the day, inshallah, and hopefully uh, what I say today will be beneficial to you personally and in terms of bringing awareness of Allah's lessons to our communities. I hope that, that some of these things, the insights that I share today, you will also then be able to share. And if anyone at any point would like to look at my slides, I'm always happy to share them so you can email me and, and I will uh, happily pass those on. And I have my email at the end of the slide deck. So last week, we're going to just recap last week, inshallah, in about three minutes or so. We talked about this idea of the human creation being from one soul. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls that the this uh, nafsun wahida. And we saw how we moved from the nafsun wahida, this united soul, into a bifurcated soul that is that has men, male and female, and how we move from male and female into a re reproductive schema that proliferates all of, of humankind and how it were similar to other uh, animal species in, in that regard. We looked at the concept of the zawj and the loving, loving and mercy being the, si the signs of, uh, of a successful pairing there. We looked at the concept of equal opportunity from a spirituality perspective in the, in the Quran, and I showed you this neat Thing that even at the structural level between the roots for mother and father in the Quran, Abba wa and, and uh, Hamza mean, mean those roots, there is a near numeric uh, equality. We also looked then at discussions of beings in paradise and some of the language around that. We looked at Adam and Hawa as the prototypical male and female figures in, in the Quran. We looked at the meaning of the word hawet in the Arabic language. We looked at how the speech of the pair in their tauba is um, done in unison and how um, the spiritual lessons that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us in that. We also looked at this interesting structural parallel in the Mus'haf between Surah Al-Baqarah and Surah Ahl-Imran, where these verses in the exact same position 
in the first instance, refute the idea that woman is somehow uniquely responsible for the fall of humankind, which is an idea that we find in pre-Islamic um, monotheistic traditions, namely Christianity. And then we also have down here in that the exact same position in Surat Ahl Imran, this refutation that somehow the girl child is less less spiritually worthy than than a boy uh, child would be with the story of the mother of of Maryam salam, dedicating her child to the womb we also then took a look at the aziz misr and we talked about how quranic stories involving women have women on all um, sorts of moral, uh, the, all sorts of positions on the moral spectrum, from women damned to hell to figures like Maryam alayhi salam, who's chosen above all the women of the world in terms of her piety and uh, degree of, of of chosenness. You know, alongside with with the women around the, the blessed Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So we looked at the concept of beauty and how the Quran doesn't describe particular features of, of women's beauty typically when it describes female characters it's it's focused on their uh, ihsan their moral beauty typically and we saw how that was even the case with yusuf who we know to be aesthetically a very a beautiful uh, human being from from the prophetic tradition we also see that the, the quran is, is describing uh, this quality of muhsin meaning um, virtuous, coming from the same root that means beauty in, in Arabic. Uh, so we looked a little bit at the story and about the lessons that it gives for today's world and how we can't just look at the figure of the wife of the vizier, um, Aziz Masr, the Imrat Aziz Masr, as a woman figure alone. We have to understand that she also represents an aristocracy that is negligent in delivering justice to a wronged person we have to also understand her uh, in in the complexity of of her relationship to yusuf yusuf as a an ethnic minority someone who is disenfranchised in the land etc we also looked at how the quranic stories how oftentimes even when they're focused on a particular patriarchal figure such as Adam, Noah, Ibrahim, Imran, uh, the stories oftentimes do focus on the role of the women figures there. So I showed you how in this verse, this is Surat Ahl Imran, we see that the um, the house of Imran is stressed uh, as, as part of this matriarchal, in a way, lineage, because Imran is never really depicted in the Quran. Those The pious figures in that household include uh, the mother of Maryam, Maryam, and then um, Isa, uh, alayhim salam, alayhim salam. Uh, so I showed you how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even in the prayer of the wife of Imran, she knows to call Allah by Allah's blessed names, as Samia Alim. So here, here we have a, an example of a woman who's using the Asma Allah in, in her speech in a very poignant way that in fact, I'm going back again to the slide before, reflects how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, describes uh, describes himself here in the verses that immediately precede her speech. So there's a beautiful parallel there that, that gives us a subtle affirmation of her level of spiritual knowing. Then we looked at uh, her words, her expression about that the, the male is not like the female. And we talked about the different, the various um, interpretations and possible meanings for what that is. We looked at as well, the, the pangs of childbirth that Maryam alayhi salam experiences and the power of having her pangs of labor. There's this speech that she expresses is, you know, an experience that women necessarily experience you know, must experience to reproduce the human species, how the, the Quran puts that in the mushaf so that even male reciters, as they're going through the mushaf, pronounce the speech of a woman in, in labor. And then we also looked at uh, the, the Ummu Nuh, I mean, Ummu Musa, uh, salam, and how she receives this personal inspiration. And in this way, we compared her to this this ability to just trust God's message 
uh, we compared Omomusa to the story of um, the the sacrifice that that Abraham you know sees in his dream of his of his son. So we compared these two parent figures having to cast off their uh, blessed ch children uh, in a sense and just trusting that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will has the best plan in mind. And then we looked as well to see how the all of the figures around. Musa, all the female figures are at various junctures saving him. So it's a real inverse of the Disney storyline of a, a princess, you know, the old 1950s Disney storyline of a, a male, uh, you know, being saved by a male saving a female uh, in need. This is really, in terms of the gender uh, dynamics, the, the opposite type of story. So that brings us to, I know I left out some things that we covered in the first week, but that was just a little teaser for those of you to kind of catch us up to speed with where we are. So now we're going to set about the task, inshallah, of reading the Quran in the revelatory order. And we don't have an exact a um, precise like mushaf in the revelatory order it said that some of the female i mean some of the companions of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did uh, keep down the revelatory order but to to at least my knowledge we we don't have an exact mushaf some um people have tried to go back and do various schemas uh lala bakhtiar is one person who has a volume out that traces the order in in english uh, for those of you who are interested, although it is in some of the uh, verses, we do have a clear indication of precisely when in the prophetic, the, the prophetic uh, life, when on this revelatory schema that they did come down and other verses, we, we piece it together based on some of the stylistic features of the Quran or um, other verses that are proximate to that one, although we do know that sometimes verses would come down and the Prophet ﷺ would be instructed to place them in the middle of one uh, surah unit that, that had already been revealed. So all this to say that it is, it's a sketch, it's this this part is not an exact science, but inshallah, as I go through this revelatory order, mentioning some of the figures that we saw last week and, and adding a few different dimensions onto it, we'll begin to see how the stories not only speak to us today, but spoke to first and foremost the Prophet وسلم, who's receiving guidance from Allah through these stories and also the early Muslim community. So we have several dynamics, several movements going on here. Last week I talked about how there were three women who were women figures who were irrevocably damned in, in the Quran, the wives of Nuh and Lut. Uh, we'll look at a little bit more the wife of Lut today. Uh, and I mentioned that the wife of Abu Lahab here we have uh, down down here the the surah uh, damning both Abu Lahab and his wife. This, as I mentioned last week, is the very first female figure to be mentioned in the in the Quran. And uh, Umu Jamil, as as was Hakonya, her nick her nickname, she uh, was an aristocratic woman who was very arrogant, and at one point, kind of. Uh, had this um, beautiful necklace that that she had evoked a uh, had um, uh, tried to say that she would kind of sell it and use the the funds against the messenger. Had uh, in various narrations had you know, cursed uh, the messenger upon her necklace, and so we see here that it's like when Abu Lahab curses the prophet, uh, you know, using the the expression of, uh, of with his two hands, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds with this kind of Quranic roast. And we see that the the carrier of firewood here would have been the lowly station, not a suitable to aristocratic woman. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is insulting her, targeting her arrogance based on the fact that she was wealthy. And so it's a real reminder, first of all, arrogance in general and and how that's what we could possibly call the cardinal sin in in the in the islamic tradition but also i think it's very poignant exactly what the reason she was so arrogant was because she was aristocratic so it's a, early on a very poignant lesson in in the mushaf 
that neither wealth nor you know family connections, her being you know proximate um, through through her husband to the family of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So none of that um, none of that matters, and we'll see that over and over again as we come to discussions of family in the Quran in so many ways, both directly and through stories. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us that it doesn't matter who our parents are, who our children are, that if we're not really upright ourselves, that's our the ultimate accountability factor. And so we see this that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this this rope of uh this necklace that she wears with uh, an arrogant pride becomes this uh, this twisted fire uh, wood starter like you know so her she's carrying the firewood her husband the lahab the father of the flame is uh is being tortured of the by the flames and her necklace is like this this the um starting agent potentially of the fire we also see in these very, these are very stark. The Quran comes really strong in in the beginning of the revelatory sequence. Here's another reference to female figures generally. There is a story in um, in the Sira that has to do with blowing on knots that comes later on in the Meccan period. So some commentators link this particular mention in um, uh, very. Uh, to that event that, that happens later. But according to the majority, this uh um this the this surah that probably is one of the first ones many of you all all learned, um uh, here we have the nafathati fil aqad. Um, the aqad are um not so this refers to the black the dark magic tradition. So we see we've, we have arrogance it condemned it through the Abu Lahab and his wife. And then early on in the Mus'haf as well, we have dark magic. So using the occult sciences to um, to harm people. And so we as Muslims, we take refuge from the dark sciences and we don't um, participate in them. And again, this Nafathati, there is a story where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where, where um, he was cursed by uh, a spell of, of blowing and tying uh, knots and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the guidance to understand uh, how to lift that that dark magic upon him so in as we go through and think about the the quranic order and we think about where are the relatives of the prophet sallallahu mentioned in the quran we see really early in surah al-ara which is one of the earliest surahs that that has little almost like uh pre-stories of a lot of the stories that later get fleshed out in the mushaf we see at the very end uh, of surah al-shura we see this reference to the um the the ashira of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, and ashira here is uh, we could translate that into english as kin so this right here after all, after um, Surah Shura, we have as a, as a closing this idea that you know the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the warner first to the closest of kin. Now, of course, we we see that the Prophet in, the, in his closest of kin, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we have those like uh, Sayyidina Khadija, uh, radiAllahu Anha, and uh, and uh, Sayyidina Ali, radiAllahu Anhu, and uh, who you know, are are uh, of the the you know most blessed supporters of the prophet as as long as they're alive, and then we also have as we've we've just seen uh, we've seen this curse on on the hands of of Abu Lahab. So we see within the prophet Muhammad's own family these these two extremes, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gives this explicit guidance to to the prophet it's just i mean such a beautiful beautiful um metaphor here of of the janah the the wing uh you know as a you know lower lower your wing to those who follow you of the believers so and warn your closest kin um and then there's this but then at the same time allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says look if if they don't listen then disassociate with with what they're doing. Um, so the 
it's a lesson for us as as we we go through the the world many of us do come from families i know even my own family i'm sitting here on, on easter day of course uh for for many people around the world this is easter and we do have split families and this is a, a guidance for us and just to to say that we do when we speak to our families right we we talk in the best of language allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a lot of guidance in the in the quran for how to do interreligious dialogue those of you who know me that know that's one of my other uh, passions in life so we do there's there's plenty of guidance on that and um but nonetheless our the first example for us for for how to do that is as muslims is the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself who you know faced uh not in you know within his own family this predicament of you know some people uh, following him very enthusiastically some people uh, treating him horribly on the account of his message sallallahu alaihi wasallam and then we find people in the middle who supported him even though theologically they didn't uh, have a conviction yet and so i think that that some of us if i think of my own family i i would put them in in the camp that you know supports me uh my christian side even though that they they don't have a theological conviction uh, may Allah guide us all so we can we can just think about our own situation in light of how the Prophet وسلم, received um, guidance from Allah. So uh, an early message, and this this is a verse that kind of you could read through really quickly in in, in the Mus'haf. Um, it does come in Surah the Nahl, which is this magnificent surah asking us to look at the natural world and understand all of the the miracles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like these everyday miracles. I'm, I'm sitting here outside. I'm just, there's a robin like 10 minutes from, I mean, 10, 10 paces from me, just, you know, going about its business. Like subhanAllah, all of this, the beauty, we we understand the beauty of Jannah because we can look up and inshallah, we're, we are able to access surroundings that that are, you know, part naturally um, beautiful and, and uncorrupted by, by the, by human, um, uh, fasakh, human um, yeah, corruption. So we have here in the middle of uh, Surah Al-Nahal, the, the, the Surah of the Bee, we have this reference to you know this unnamed woman here who untwisted and, and uh, unsped spun her thread after it was strong. So those of you who know the spinning process, uh, I was recently in Ireland and watched uh, you know how this happens. It's Subhanallah, right? That the, the clothes we wear, uh, if they're not synthetic, if they're natural fibers, right? They were once on an animal, uh, or once in a plant, and uh, so Subhanallah, Allah gives us these blessings such that we can use them. And here's an example, uh, again a negative example, how not to be like this this particular figure, who it it said that. You know, maybe she was doing this. She she wasn't fully cognitively um, sound, and and you know this maybe this wasn't not necessarily like a morally blameful example. It's just an example, but uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gives us all of these provisions. You know, gives us iman, gives us the Quran, which you know by the way is like a rope, right? So there's a there's a little connection there, so we can like you know hold on to the the rope rope of of allah like the the tradition of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam his blessed example and may we not be like the people who we have all of these resources at our disposition and then we we don't put them to use and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know reminds us that that life is is just but a test and that uh you know there's there's going to be a report card i'm a teacher right grades come out every now and then I, yeah, so I have to exactly say, you know, is what what type of student is this? So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, make us go through our lives in such a way that that on on Yom al Qiyamah, inshallah, that that our our scales are ultimately for the good. So we can think about you know, this this woman figure who, you know, has this strongly spun thread, but uh, nonetheless doesn't benefit from it. Early on, these are all very, very early verses in the revelatory order of the Mus'haf, as far as we can tell. So we also have here uh, this reference to the, um, the this is sort of the Neml. So we, we went from sort of the Nahl to sort of the Neml, going from the bee to the ant, 
here. We looked at uh, verses of Surat al Naml, and I'll go back to them and, and review them today in relation to the Queen of Sheba, Malik at Saba. But here we see verses that refer to the family of Saleh, who uh, is one of the Arabian prophets uh, um, who are mentioned in, in the Quran. Um, at least we have three uh, Arabian prophets mentioned by name. These are figures that don't appear that predate Islam, the you know the the Islam of the the seventh century, the, the Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his community. And Saleh, this is the only <clears throat> This is the only reference to his family down here, but you see that the tribal heads in the city are causing a corruption in the land. So we have the fasad, the the fest, the the fest, the the right in here, and then we see that they're not only after Saleh. That they're after his family too. You can see right here as well. They have this plan, and and so if we think about approximately when these verses are coming down, we realize that this is a very difficult time for the Prophet Muhammad's family. So Allahu alaihi wasallam. So there is a direct parallel in which these verses potentially could have spoken to the the Prophet Muhammad's family that Allah subhanahu wa taala is protecting family of Saleh and is helping them escape these disbelieving people who are intent on um, destroying them. So, you know, we can, th this is a prime example of why it's so helpful sometimes to read the Quran with the knowledge of when the revelatory sequence, the verses are coming, because we can have a greater appreciation for not only the, the Quran's, uh, you know, universality, because we still see people who are <clears throat> You know, driven out from the lands uh, just for being Muslim or just for preaching, you know, the message uh, of Tawheed. And so here we have an example that runs that that pertains to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam specifically and his family, as well as our universal uh, human condition when we experience circumstances of of severe persecution. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, you know, help the Uyghur Muslims and, you know, the the all of the places where we do find Muslims being uh, thrown out of the land on, on account of, of their conviction, their, their ethnic identity or their religious identity. The um, As we're going through the revelatory order, I told you I'll, I'll return to Surah Al-Namal in a minute, but I wanted you to, to I wanted you to see here Another family that's fleeing, the family of Lut, that's uh, fleeing a, a morally corrupt place, and that is seeking Allah's, uh, you know, protection as they escape. And then we have these very early references that talk about just the Ajus. This, uh, and you see here that this, the um, the word here is just just an old you know, an old woman, and it's not even here, it's really not even, um, uh, um, well, you see, we don't, we don't understand that that's Lut's wife um, yet in, in the revelatory order in any case. Uh, so, so at least twice in, in Surat al-Shu'ara and Surat al-Safat, we, we have mention of this old woman. She comes either direct references, understanding that she's the wife of Lut, or just these references to this old woman, seven different places, seven different verses in the Quran mention this figure. Now, if you remember back to my first week, I told you that the Quran gives us all of these different permutations of moral goodness, and um, we have old figures and young figures in, in the Quran. So... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even as we have this example of this old woman, like lest uh, it's possible to make a harmful stereotype of old woman based on this verse, we have another reference. See this aduz here as well. And this, of course, is, is reference to, to Sarah Ibrahim, the wife of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And here we have you know, one of the most blessed women in our in our sacred history. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, for thinking uh, of examples of old women, we have 
totally both ends of the moral spectrum in terms of the, the Quran's depiction of older uh, older women, women here. And last week I showed you how when the Quran tells the story of Ibrahim and Sarah having um, having this blessed child miraculously when both of them are old and she has been um, you know they haven't conceived up until this point. We noted that the Quran refers to her as Ahl al-Bayt, which is a direct parallel, which is why I started out the the, the class today with the, the dua sending blessings upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the fam and his his family and the fam the, the Prophet Ibrahim and, and his family. Um, may Allah be pleased with, with all of them. Uh, so here again we have that the the verse um stressing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know makes makes wonderful things happen for for those of us who who have faith and if we're going to take a lesson from you know, from the, the Quranic stories in in this particular this is now moving into middle late Medinan period many of the driving emphasis of these stories is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mercy on the believers. Allah will create conditions for the believers to thrive. And if we think about what is happening in the life of the Prophet, وسلم, we know, you know, some of his family has had to go to a habash in Ethiopia. You know, some some of his his family had, you know, they're in in circumstances, you know, marriages have had to be broken off. Uh, they're they're finding this is beginning to be the the part where the part where, where the Banu Hashim suffer the boycott and they're driven kind of to, to you know, to into starvation. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, protect, I'm thinking of the people of Yemen who are experiencing horrific de degrees of starvation. May, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, support the believing people and, and, and bring them justice. So that's the theme of many of these middle to, to late Meccan uh, surahs. Uh, now, this is the Surah Tahrim is a very late surah. It's one of the, the later ones in the revelatory order. But we I did just want to show you that here we do have the wife of, of Nuh and the wife of Lut. So here's a direct reference. And this is like coming at the very end of the Mus'haf, sort of being like, remember those six other times that we mentioned this woman? You know, here we're mentioning her again. And uh, Surah Tahrim is really like the core message of the, the, the surah is like, there are these two ways to go in life. Either you're going to be pious or you're going to be corrupt. That's the sort of the essence. And, you know, don't, so don't make any excuses, right? Like we're, we're all morally a accountable, which is, um, you know, in our, in our, so the core message of the Quran, in, in essence, right there. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents that core message using, we saw the beginning of Surah Al-Tahrim, and I'll, I'll talk about that, the beginning of Surah Al-Tahrim, a bit more next week. And we have here this reference going back to these two women figures. And then right at the end, we have these references to um, the, the wife of Pharaoh, Im Imrat Pharaoh, who, Pharaoh, who we saw last week and who I talked about in terms of this beautiful speech. These lines are the last speech in the Mus'haf, you know, as we as we read it through from, from the Fatiha um, to the end. And uh, last week we talked about Surah, surah um, the uh, uh, Maryam alayhi salam and the the lineage of the Ahlam Imran. So what I want you to understand about Surah Al-Tahrim uh, is that we have here the two wives mentioned at the beginning who we'll cover next week. We have these two corrupted women mentioned and then we have these two blessed women who are uh, you know have a, a station of proximity to to Allah in the par paradisal realm may Allah make us uh you know like like those who um who have nearness to have have uh, proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in this life and the next inshallah so this is sort of tahrim mentions or has to do with or directly mentions six different women figures two from the family of the prophet two from you know here we have that relate to the pre-Islamic stories who are righteous and two related to 
the pre-Islamic stories were corrupt. That's a very uh, balanced uh, in its approach uh, to, you know, not not only is it giving us these two, um, you know, ends of the, the moral spectrum, but even if, in its representation of women figures, it's uh, extremely balanced. So I promised you we'd get back to Malik at Saba. This is another, as I mentioned before, Surat al um, uh, and Nemal is in this um, mid to late Meccan period, and I we looked at last week how the the queen's journey here, how she submits with Suleiman to the Lord of all the worlds, even as there's this military conflict between the two of them. But I did want to point out here that I didn't get to point it out next last week, where the hoopoo, the hoopoo bird. And if you've never looked up what a hoopoe bird looks like, um, please do that at some point. It's really ex extraordinary. Uh, and the hoopoe bird is a bird that helps. It's it's um, the national bird of of the, uh, uh, I think it's the national bird of the state of Israel. I believe I read that. And uh, so correct me, someone, if that's if that's not right. But uh, you know, the it's a bird that is indigenous to the area where this story takes place. And in the in our story here, you know, the, the bird is out, the hoopoe bird is out, and Suleiman wants to know where is this hoopoe bird. The hoopoe bird apparently is used as a way to find water. So the hoopoe bird helps, um, you know, people uh, scout for for water. And so those are all things I I'm not a, a botanist in any way or, or a knowledgeable about the the animal world to a great extent, but those are some things that I that I read that were fascinating. Uh, so the hoopoe bird does find this uh, woman figure and notice that his, the, the hoopoe is not um, kind of condemning her for ruling as a woman. Of course, we get this kind of chauvinistic idea that it, that occasionally comes up. And even today, some mosque boards, even in the U.S., like won't allow women on the mosque boards because they, they have an issue with uh, women's leadership or the like. Uh, but if we see right here, here's a woman ruler and the hoopoe bird doesn't have, you know, he's surprised that, that, you know, he's found a woman ruler. Okay. So he does, he does notice that right here, you know, that it is, a, it is a woman, but what he is concerned about is in fact that the people have this uh, sun worship. So they're, they're bowing down to the sun uh, instead of Allah. And as the whole story plays out, we see that that Malik at Saba is in fact able to lead her people to the worship of of Allah through Solomon's gentle prodding, but also through her own interior uh, realizations. It's a it's a wonderful story that that highlights women's leadership in uh, moving from negative circumstances into positive circumstances. May our communities be blessed uh, with many convert figures who enrich our lives and our communities and also many uh, women leaders who are able to exert their kind of inner knowing and, and bring our communities uh, into a closer relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this period as well, we're still, this is still middle Medinan to, or sorry, middle Meccan to late Meccan. You see a lot of large chunks of Quranic stories are coming down in, in, in this, this particular period. And we have these first references to uh, Ismail, alayhi salam, and his family uh, you see down here and he in, used to enjoy his people so ahl uh, ahl as i mentioned the first week could be translated people it more commonly could be translated as like family like like uh, or it could also be depending on the context ahl can be wife as well like ahl bait we saw that to refer to sara uh, so here we have this reference to the family of Ismail. This is in, in Surah Maryam. 
which also comes down in this period. And in a, in a certain sense, as the Prophet وسلم, is getting ready to move from Mecca to Medina, in Medina, is he's already started to have contact with the Habash, with the Ethiopian Christians, and will have even more contact with the, the Christian communities in the Medinan period. And also, of course, will have connections with the Jewish communities in in Medina. So this point, this is right, these verses are in the period that's right before the Hijra. So we start to see a very strong connection to both the family of Ibrahim and the family of Musa. And then we also start to see references that pertain to Maryam and the, the Ahnan Ran. So all of those and those families become very important in this 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 period. So what we see, and this is absolutely fascinating, this we see even in surahs that are late, uh, as as this one is right here, we have a pattern of hearkening back to these early communities. So here's a a, a surah that is showing this, is talking about Ibrahim as the you know, excellent example and showing how Ibrahim is handling you know, his, his father, not accepting his message. Now keep in mind that early Muslims now are having to actually leave their, their core you know, family relationships and migrate. And so we have stories that relate to families being divided along lines of, of faith. Uh, but we also have this emphasis of the, the uswa and the uswa hasana, this, this beautiful example. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, let's see, here we go. Uh, is also this beautiful example. So the, the Quran is making a direct link between the family of Ibrahim uh, salam, and the family of uh, the Prophet Muhammad salam. and so by extension their families also become these excellent examples for for the believers uh, let's see how I'm doing on time I think I'm getting near the end of my frontal piece and then we'll go into a, a um, into a discussion of either the verses that I presented today or kind of connecting what I presented last week into today. But before we do that, let me just uh, wrap it up here that we find throughout the Quran, we find this emphasis on the ahl, the, the close family. And so here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in a surah that's dedicated primarily to the life of Musa, Surah Taha, we find that in the ending verses, kind of near coming as the sort of coming to a conclusion, we find that this direct command and join prayer upon your family. So, you know, in a in a universal sense, that could read, you know, anyone like enjoy pr enjoy prayer upon your enjoin prayer upon your family, but in a specific sense, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and be steadfast therein. Uh, so this is just a, an example of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is tying, after having narrated all of these stories about the figure of Musa, tying it back to the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this, just to show you, uh, the I'm going to read you just a passage from my book when I talk about this. Uh, this is page 133. It's a section that's called uh, Kindred Prophetic Missions. You all know that I'm interested in the structural parallels in the Mus'haf. So in, um, in this verse, 3369, that I have on the slides here. Uh, so this verse, um, this verse is near the end of Surat Ahzab and ties Surat Ahzab that focuses on the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his family and the struggles and the battle of the trench and you know, family relations and and gives all this guidance about the to the, the Prophet's family has this verse at the end, 69 here, that that recalls Musa, okay? Um, peace be upon him. 
So look at this verse. Okay. Oops. This verse right here that comes at the end of the story of Musa in the Quran and talks about the family of the Prophet Muhammad. This is the fifth to last verse of Surah Taha. And this is the fifth to last verse of Surah Ahl Ahzab. So what I say in the book, I say that um, that the par this parallel between these two verses, so a verse referring to the family of Musa as the fifth to last verse in, in a surah that's mainly about the, the family of the prophet, and then a verse about the prophet's family at the end of surah Taha, a surah that's virtually uh, entirely about Musa, Islam and his family, I say such verses reinforce the connection stylistically and topologically, not just between past prophets, but to the households of these figures and their followers as well. So, you know, 20, uh, verse 134 of Surah Taha um, is the fourth to last verse, and Surah, and Surah Ahzab, verse 69, is the fifth to last verse of Surah Ahzab. So there's a structural parallel in parody in the framing of the surahs and as well as their kind of thematic connections about the importance of of the prophetic families not just the figure of the, the prophet themselves so i hope you followed that last that last point there i didn't explain it entirely as well as i could have perhaps so as we go into next week we're going to be looking at the concept of like gender justice in societies and looking at women in social reform so this is what we're going to be looking at in as with regard to the medinan period as i've left you the verses today are almost entirely um meccan period with some some medinan verses so that you see some of the parallels but we're going to go really heavy uh, next week into these. We're going to look at some of the ways in which the Quran adjusts the legal framework to be more women friendly. We're going to look at more of the examples from the, the Prophet وسلم, of the women in his household. Again, I, as I promised last week, we'll look a little bit more on the affair of the lie. We'll look at uh, the Surah Al-Mujaddala and other situations that are these case studies that show us the power of and the the examples of these figures in you know how their examples play out in um, in our lives today so i'm curious to hear all of your questions inshallah we can go into the question and answer session and before i stop sharing i promise to give my email there so feel free you can either go to a website that I have set up that that you can put in a contact form and send me email that way or feel free to use my my direct email and as I usually say give me about three four weeks to respond and if you don't hear from me then send it again sometimes I respond faster than that but um may uh before I forget to say it again may Allah you know put blessing in our in our Ramadan and if you don't have a copy of the women and gender book there's uh I misspoke last week. My my author discount is 40% and this code gives you 30%. But uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, you know, like make it easy on those of you. If there's anyone who has uh, circumstances where you, you'd like the book but can't uh, you know, make the extra expense, you please write me too and I'd be happy to um, get you a copy so that you can enjoy it without having to to make the, the expense. So... Um, Okay, let's let's stop the share there, and I'm curious to hear what uh, is on all of your minds and hearts. And, and inshallah, we'll we'll hear, hear some good uh, observations are welcome as well. It doesn't have to be all questions. Oh, Dr. Ibrahim, thank you so much, Zakhla, for that um, presentation. I feel as if we've hit this midpoint in Ramadan, and everybody is sort of in this nap zone, as you've referenced. Um, but I hope that we do generate some questions or comments or even just some feedback. You know, what is it, what stood out to you all um, about today's presentation versus, or even anything from last week? Was there, were there things that sort of hit you as last week's presentation stewed in your mind that you wanted to bring back today um, that you're more than welcome anyone to, 
to, again, post your questions in the chat box, um, either send them directly to Dr. Ibrahim, send them directly to me, or just raise your hand um, with that. And I, and I also want to echo um, your offer uh, with regards to the book purchase. Uh, you know, Muslim Space, I mean, we love the book. Uh, and and I mentioned it last week. It, it I think it's an important book to have on everyone's bookshelf. So uh, feel free to also reach out to to the Muslim Space email info at muslimspace.org. Should there be a barrier, a cost barrier to acquiring this book, we would be more than happy to assist you with that um, as well. I wanted to until we have some maybe some more questions come in. Unless you did you have anything directly to you, Dr. Ibrahim? Uh, no, not yet. I just opened up the chat as well, so. Yeah, I'll keep that open. Okay, through. awesome. I actually wouldn't mind, and we did this last year with um, with our presenter last year. Uh, I wouldn't mind maybe taking just a slight detour with you. Uh, and you know, one thing at Muslim Space, we set this um, this goal a few years ago of elevating the voice and knowledge and expertise of our female scholars within our community. Um, which is why, you know, of course, you are here. Dr. Ferial was here last year. We've had a few others in the past. It's a different vibe that we really appreciate. But there's always this question is, how did you get to where you are? You know, because mm. you are an inspiration, whether you realize it or not, to not just, you know, all of us here in, who are attending, who watch the recording, but also to our younger Muslima, our mo younger Muslimas who are maybe seeing folks at the pulpit, seeing folks to, at, at the at the speaker table and thinking, that looks really cool. I would like to be up there. Um, maybe, could you, would you mind sharing just a little bit of your, your path? To yeah, there's, I think one of the things that I find in specifically like the women scholars uh, that I've been able to learn from and encounter is an emphasis on epistemic humility that I really enjoy and value. And so many of us, you know, I see this in our, in our male scholars as well, but I think oftentimes whereas women are trained to embody this in a certain way is that even as we do acquire some level of, of expertise or experience in a subject, it only makes us more aware of all of the, the questions that we still have, all of the things that we don't know. And, and you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may, may, you know, Allah grant knowledge to, to the community of Muslims. But I think that there's a, um, sometimes there's a little bit of a, a danger in looking to the scholars as like the, the, the exemplars. And so I'm always very careful to say, you know, I'm, I am, um, uh, like I don't want anyone to to look up to me too much, right? Because I'm I'm just also trying to get through, you know, life and make good decisions and and you know do my ibadah and and the like. And so, uh, but yeah, how did I? The more and more I think there's great opportunities to keep studying the dean, and and there's so many subjects in the dean, right? Like whatever we find our proclivities leaning towards so for instance for me I, I was really enjoying like Arabic language and, and I enjoy stories and um, I enjoy kind of more theology more than law and so I think for people to realize too that you can sort of look inside and say what what are the qualities that Allah has given me like some people are really excellent listeners and you know spiritual healers are really great at um you know there's all there's all these different kinds of knowledges some people have extraordinary memories and where where that's part of the gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has has given them to use and so i think the first step if someone is thinking like how can i become more educated for the dean you know we start obviously with our characters because we you know information without insight is pretty useless um so we start you know we start there and we start with the muraqaba like the you know the 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 contemplation of our own selves and the state of our hearts and you know the spiritual practices you know such as the fasting and the prayer and dhikr and the like that that help clean us out you know because we can't we can't hold knowledge until we're we let go of ego right because the knowledge won't benefit us unless it has you know unless the heart can can hold it in a, in a way so 
then, you know, to find good teachers is so very important. And good teachers, some good teachers can help us with our spiritual lives and, you know, emptying out our ego and the tezkia. And other teachers can help us with more of the kind of intellectual content based piece. If you find a teacher that does both, you know, stick very close to their side. Um, mashallah, that's that's a, a, a beautiful find. The the way of um yeah, like I mentioned, there's lots of different branches of serving. And so for me, I because I was educated a lot in in like kind of intellectual places that for me has been a way of service, like service through transmitting um, what I'd like to think of as knowledge, inshallah. So the, um, but you know, many other people, they find their, they find their connection through like memorization of the Quran, or they find their, their connection through service to the, to the Ummah. So it's, we need all kinds of people to, make our communities um, vibrant but in terms of practical places to study there's so much online like mashallah I know that people joke it's like you could get a YouTube degree right but but honestly we have so many so many great resources uh, Abdul Hakim Murad uh, is is one scholar who I think for me ha has been a really influential teacher because again someone who combines the intellectual really robust beautiful reflections on the deep meaning and significance of our dean with also this the imperative to do the tezkia work so that that's someone who's who's been really important um to me then especially for women it's really important to find a community of other women who are also if you're if you're going to be like a, a student uh, you know, seeking knowledge, you need other people who are going to surround you and push you and, you know, send you resources and give you information. So that's really critical to set up a, a community of, you know, and specifically women, because you can study together in a way that's not always possible uh, across a, a gendered in environments. So those are some initial thoughts kind of from my own life and experience and, and what's worked for me. But, you know, if, if there's another like very specific question about if people on the call even have questions about like programs or courses to have a uh, kind of a, a, an official, more official types of training, um, I'm happy to answer those questions too. Thank you for that. It was a very generous and um, very humble response. I, you know, I think we all appreciate that and a uh, great suggestion on, um, on uh, Hakeem Murad, uh, mashallah, he's got such a, um, a beautiful, the way he speaks, it's so beautiful and calming and um, you can connect to him, I think uh, very easily. He's out of uh, Cambridge. Cambridge Muslim College. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. What a great YouTube channel. My husband's a huge fan. So that's, that's a great suggestion. Thank you for that. Um, and, and I just realized I hadn't unmuted everybody. So now everyone has the ability to unmute. You're more than welcome. It's a small group today. So you're more than welcome to just unmute. I just want to keep this conversation going, but anyone, please jump on in with any of your questions. Um, you had mentioned arrogance in your presentation. You had mentioned, um, you know, kind of that over uh, extreme, um, oppressive behaviors, right? Where, where there's starvation and you, you connected it to Yemen, what's going on in Yemen or where people have to deny their faith, like what's happening with the Uyghurs. You know, we hear this, we hear this um, a lot of times in lectures and in talks, but what you said about arrogance, I think initially um, is sort of, and I don't, I don't want to misquote you, but it, you know, kind of being like the, the, cardinal sin within Islam. You know, to us, a lot of times I think we feel as though Islam came and it was, its main purpose was the oneness of God. You know, people rejected um, the oneness of God. They were worshiping idols and uh, they needed to just accept that there was one God and then do your prayers and give your zakat. 
Can you elaborate a little bit more on some of those other elements that you brought in, um, arrogance? Because it, it, you, you put a lot of emphasis on that. Um, would you mind just sharing a bit more about that? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, as a, as a spiritual practice, I think if, if we ask ourselves, like we, we all experience arrogance in, in, you know, in situ in certain situations and as, as pertaining to kind of specific parts of, of our identity. And so do we, do we know kind of like what are our arrogance patterns? Do we know our, our, the triggers, you know, it could be, could be around knowledge. It could be around wealth. It could be around like ethnicity, nationality. It could be, I mean, just, just so many, uh, even as we go through the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like, gives us these little moments and tests us, right? Are we, are we going to, to let the ego and, you know, the, the ego feeds on, on, on arrogance, like the heart feeds on dhikr. And so we can't, we can't be both arrogant and kind of humble before Allah. Like Allah is the, the greatest, the one who, you know, has every right to be arrogant, right? We don't, we don't have any, any uh, right to be arrogant. What, what do we want to be arrogant about our knowledge? Like Allah, that's like, what is our knowledge? Our knowledge is nothing. You know, are we going to be arrogant about our wealth? Like, you know, whatever we enter our garden and, you know, think we have it all and it gets destroyed. So it's like anything that we think we could be arrogant about, if we're if we understand Tawheed, it's there's it's not a basis to be arrogant. You know, it's not something that we we can, you know, it's 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 so very whatever we have is so very little to begin with. Um, you know, we're we're gonna be arrogant about our status or something, like, you know, like you know we could be dead tomorrow. How's that for status? So that that's. You know, these are, and and we get these kind of constant reminders throughout life in our interactions with people and in our circumstances. And so it's hard though. It's hard, right, to just decide not to be not to be arrogant. Like it actually it takes it takes practices. So it takes um like just even doing just you know, stuff for law lazim, stuff for law lazim. You have an arrogant thought, like it's like you know, um, I'm thinking of like if a if a sports team doesn't isn't paying attention or something, and the coach is like, "All right, five push-ups or something, or you know, whatever." It's like we need we need to discipline the nafs. Like you know, it had an arrogant thought. You know, hundred stuck for laws. You know, wh whatever that is, we just need to we need to break it. Like like be firm with it. Um, so that's you know that that's something about arrogance. But as I was going back and, and thinking about a lot of those early stories, I'm like, wow, these are these are kind of negative. The first portrayals of all these women figures are are really negative. Like, okay, don't be blowers on knots. There's a lot of, um, you know, even in our speech, like maybe. We just like the 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 nefetati vlogs, but just like you know, our speech can be sometimes like so violent. Some of of those other early stories, they're they're really targeted and pinpointed in the ways that the human being can can go wrong. So Allah gives us you know, this this mercy, like I was talking about all these blessings that are all around the earth and like the woman who has the strong string and she's fraying it herself. So it, like all of these things, you know, like Allah gives us all of the tools. Everything is right in front of us. The the Quran is there, the prophetic sunnah, you know, like environments even where we can, where we can thrive. Like, I mean, I'm sitting here, like it's a, it's a gorgeous day. I'm at an institution of learning. Like, what are my excuses? I have no excuses and to to not be kind of running at full speed, uh, inshallah. So I think that's that's our case. And many times we might ask, like, at least I experienced this, like, why are we in a Western country? Right? There's just there's so many distractions and we're not like hearing the event and like everybody around us isn't running to prayer. But if we can 
if we can be and have that discipline to do you know do the ibadah to uphold ourselves to a higher moral standard when the standard around us is kind of low this is you know the if we can do it in these circumstances, inshallah, it would be much easier to do it if any of us are living in times and spaces and places where, where, um, you know, the, the, the kind of, uh, we're surrounded by people who are, who are, you know, the, you know, structuring their days around the deen and around Allah and may, um, you know, may we dig into all of the privileges that we do have living in, in, you know, many many people I think on call are uh, you know living in the U.S. or have ties at least to the U.S. So there's tremendous bounties here, but we can't uh, we can't like unravel the dean right in these places. So that's another perhaps an um, an insight that we you know Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has given us a beautiful religion. Let's like hold hold fast to it, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah, for sure. And uh, yeah, I think you're right. You know, there's, um, there's a lot of benefit that comes with right with with hardship comes ease, you know, sometimes living in a place where you're not surrounded by Islam and not surrounded by Muslims and the call to prayer five times, you can't hear it, you know, you have those struggles. And then with that comes ease. Uh, having spent a few Ramadans in uh, Muslim majority countries, I can tell you Maghrib time is the worst time to be driving on the road. So I'm more than happy staying here. <laughs> There is, there is benefit in that. Um, you know, one, one section, it was right, right at the end when you compare those two verses, right? It was a fourth to last verse of one surah and the fourth to last verse and another, another said how they mirrored each other. Um, I was like, oh my God, my mind is blown. There are times where you come across things in the Quran where it just blows your mind and it reaffirmed that this is, there's no doubt without a doubt, this is, can only be divine. Um, do you also have those moments? I had like when you stumble oh, upon these things. Do you just like what? Are, what's what are your reactions when you when maybe when you came across even just those two verses? Yeah. So alhamdulillah, I, I've been noticing that surahs. There's there's um. If if a person would would pick up the Quran and not be committed to looking closely, it might appear like it is jumbled like I've heard that from people I remember even you know like 18 19 years ago when I was a, a new Muslim not and not really able to penetrate in the same way like I wouldn't be clear why why one is going into the other or or the internal structure and then the kind of the closer that you look and you zoom in and you know from from verses to verses or from sections to surahs or across the surahs there's just so much coherence, but it's at this like micro level, oftentimes where you have to be really in tune to it and looking for it. And so this, the, the Quran doesn't bore you. Like you could, you can spend your life studying the Quran because it's continually revealing itself and the, the patterns are so intricate. And, you know, it, 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 it reminds me like now modern science is studying things at the subatomic level. Like we, you know, like we just, you just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. And you, you just keep finding these, these beautiful, beautiful parallels, like linguistic parallels, the structural parallels. So I'd encourage people, you know, to your earlier question about, you know, places to, to study or ways to study or what, like, what was my particular path? We, ha we have brilliant organizations that teach Quranic Arabic and that opens up for people a whole new way of engaging with, with the Quran. Um, you know, as much as people have tried to translate it into English and the like, it's just, it, you know, it's just not not there. And, you know, the access isn't isn't there and, until the, the Arabic access is fully there. So I would say organizations, I still take classes with them every like every week every few months i'll be in a, in a in a class so it's um that's a good resource i'll put them in the chat just because they do great work um so un unlocking the arabic of the, the the quran will also help people see those those nuances yeah for sure and also as you mentioned 
knowing the context, right? Knowing the reason of revelation, knowing when when the verses were revealed, the blower of knots, that means to us in our context, it means nothing to us, mm -hmm. right? So understanding what is that referring to? Um, so yes, read the Quran, read it in your native tongue first, right? And then inshallah, try to learn Quranic Arabic. Thank you for that, um, the reference in the chat. Um, and then also knowing the the history and the context and the sira because that will also help the the understanding and you're right there's there's just a great amount of resources i think now more than ever um for that but um but yeah just those when you when you present those verses and the way that they are in those deeper meanings or those those hidden the hidden structure you know it is uh truly truly mind-blowing um i had one more question and then I think we can we can wrap up if if anyone no one has anything else. Um, now I got to think about what my question was. Um, I will say that I did look up while you were chatting. Uh, you're right. The that bird, the hoopoe bird, hoopoe. is yep, yeah, is um, it truly is yes. You're right. It's it's the state bird of Israel. So that's interesting. We did have one question come in in the chat. So while I think of mine, I'll I'll. Uh, read you this one um uh it says here sometimes our origin story of adam is used to show a kind of superiority by saying that adam came down in mecca the kaaba mm -hmm. was the first place of worship that's where human that's where the human story originated etc this i have heard stated even at an interfaith event or at at interfaith events what do you think of this? Do we stray from the message of the origin story when we deem it to be historical? Mm -hmm. That's a fascinating question. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, different scholars have different approaches to the tradition. And because I'm, because I, I see myself mainly as anchored in the, into the Quranic context, and again, not exclusively, I don't advocate for like Quran only approach, obviously, but I always center my understandings in as much as possible what the Quran leads with and so I I generally don't rely too much on for instance if I can't if I can't trace a saying to understand exactly its origin there's a lot of things in our tradition that where exactly it came from is unclear and just for my own kind of personal integrity of, of of practice, and I think that might be just connected to my own like formation, I I only use things that that I can know exactly like where they came, where they originated in, where where they came from, and um, because I'm not uh, as well versed in early hadith transmission as. Um, as some other people like that's one one area i i don't i don't go into to those as much so for instance i don't know the the genealogy of of I, it might be a hadith but i don't know the genealogy of that particular saying so i i can't really comment on its epistemic value uh having not studied that those those that that genealogy but i try not to base you know what I what I preach and teach and kind of use use publicly on on anything that doesn't have very solid ep epistemic certainty behind it, and, and so I think it's fine to use use things in one's personal practice maybe, but in terms of what I what I what I teach publicly, like I I wouldn't use things that that I'm not like myself kind of understanding exactly where they come from so it's unhelpful I think I have to deal I would have to look way more into the origins of that particular idea to understand you know where does it come from in our dean and then also sometimes things come into our dean at later periods of time and so I always want to understand is this something that is attributed to the prophet that has you know a solid sound chain of transmission you know according to hadith criteria and, and the like so yeah so sorry i'm not not more helpful on that but i don't i don't particularly use that concept when i'm teaching in in interfaith spaces 
No, I think that was a great response. Um, uh, and that we should be cautious, right? And all of us should be cautious in what we uh, project or promote and doing our, doing our homework before we, you know, assert anything too, too strongly. Um, thank you. Uh, my question was, was really more of more. So I think it's more of a comment, but it was something that I maybe need to stew upon over the next week. Um, so we will, we'll wrap up here. Uh, we've got thank yous coming in and chat box and, uh, Dr. Ibrahim, we really appreciate your time. Again, your wisdom, your knowledge, sharing your expertise with us. I am super looking forward to next week. I think it's going to be a fantastic, um, session. Uh, as we move into the Medina period and social justice and whatnot. So thank you. Excellent. For that. Well, Mela, forgive me if there's anything that I said that wasn't uh, epistemically accurate or or true in in in, um, in another way. And Mela, reward Muslims base for everything that you're you're doing. Um, and I really do appreciate you holding space to discuss the female figures and for having me here. And thank you to all of those who are with us today. Me. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us openings in knowledge, conceptual knowledge and knowledge of the heart, inshallah. Wa ahdawana inna alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Ameen. Wa ala ahdi wa sahbihi wa salam. Ameen. Ameen. Zakallah. Take care, everybody. Inshallah.